the 2019 project ecstasies of influence conceptually uh, had a brilliant idea for me i mean uh, how how an artist from other art form thinks and how that thinking process could be converted into music this very idea itself is is brilliant and it is challenging for any musician from any uh, stream of music this is our conversation about the ecstasies of influence project 2019 in pune in flame university where the bora karuthas and me arrived on, i think on the 1st of august and um, stayed for two weeks with you uh, and at the end of these two weeks we had done a concert and recorded all the music in the studio I remember Sandeep noting down the crazy ideas that we were uh, throwing at him and he would coolly write down everything and then uh, the next day would brief us about no no these two three things are not workable let us do on, let us work on this idea now I was completely clueless what we we are going to do there was a very different aspect to look at the music which we normally don't even expect in our indian classical music and it was a, a very nice uh, view about indian classical music that got me connected to all the arts it, how all art arts are connected for the first time uh, as a musician i had to push my boundaries i had to think unconventionally about my voice about my ability to think in music there were so many new ideas and there was so much to uh, make me free as an artist sometimes we would wonder ye kaise hoga how would this finally shape up the way uh, deborah's ideation about the khaga charcha began that was something uh, I, i would have never imagined myself doing that kind of stuff in indian context and that really again helped me to uh, detach myself as a musician from the indian in quotes indian tradition and traditional musics and try to work on a completely different level of music making I was excited to go in monsoon because there was so much literature that's been written there are so many things that have been written about the idea of monsoon and longing and how that associates with the cycle of time and nature and all of these things the monsoon has a special place in the creation of uh, ecstasies of influence pune lake actually we were in a little valley the the university building the campus is in a little valley and we have these looming peaks above the the campus and i was always afraid that some day there would be an earthquake because there was so much water coming down they thought that you know just part of the mountain would slide down when we went to the city the river was incredibly small swollen too and there were reports of flooding every day going back home and being able to come back to campus was always a question mark pune saw floods after a very long time actually i think after 2004 such flooding had not happened like the air was like a like a very very um vibrant swimming pool of something and you had to somehow <laughs> navigate we were exposed to the elements in some way there was this water basin there was trees there was Natural, natural sounds all around us and we took that back into the rehearsal we arrived at night and we had a couple of hours break and i remember i remember so clearly opening the door and sort of looking out and 
the amount of water. <laughs> it, it was this thing that was, it was pervasive and it was so green and it was, you could feel like everything was just drinking. And then we had the experience of working with power failures that were much more uh, uncharacteristic than usual because equipment got so wet. I mean, the video that we got was on my iPad because all the university's equipment wasn't working. The other equipment, recording equipment I brought wasn't working. It was so between the power failures and the water. had only 14 days and we had to come up with uh, five, six, seven, whatever tracks we, we were uh, thinking of. And the ideation process had begun on first day. The nature provided us a, uh, a kind of a close uh, circle, which, which then focused hard. How strong do you think um, your music, your normal music making, is influenced by natural things like the weather or nature or other processes in nature? The nature has a connection with music, but nowadays we don't experience much. Uh, our ancestors, they have made the theories in the music which are closely related to nature. But at that time, the atmosphere was different. Nowadays, we have to struggle to, uh, you know, experience that kind of nature. Thundering, uh, lightning and the clouds gathering, the dark clouds and the uh, sense of longing for the beloved and the situations that the general typical Indian uh, agrarian society would experience all have become part of the musical tradition. When you have, say, for example, if you have a rainy season, the formulation in Indian raga system is that then you have to practice rag malar. And as Aparna has mentioned correctly, we in the new urban uh, centers of India have concretized the entire nature around us. That more the concrete, more the developed city. That seems to be the equation that uh, that is uh, popular. At Flame, with the rain, there was a constant tempo from, you know, a waterfall sound to just a dripping sound, but it was always present, always. It was just like everything was growing all the time. You, it was almost, you could hear things grow. But the rhythm was very different from when going into Pune itself and the language of the urban environment, the sound of it was so completely different. The horns, the car horns, you know, at first they were very um, obvious to me. And then of course I became accustomed to it. So it was interesting that first time going from flame into Pune and back and the rhythm changed. So I was going out in the early mornings and trying to capture the recording. And that's where you get these mixed gatherings of birds 
of all kinds and they just all come together therefore we also thought of the name khaga charcha where khaga as, as the sanskrit word means the birds and charcha is discussion when i played this clip <laughs> the first uh, the 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 look on everyone's face clearly being what are we supposed to do with this we don't have any idea this can make music and especially i noticed that i can't go beyond the music there's no discernible rhythm there's no discernible melody there's not even really a harmony to it here was an opportunity for us to to treat ourselves as birds in the first place not to mimic the birds but use our voice differently so as to depict the intensity of conversation that the birds are having we are not supposed to do that experimentation in the regular singing to bring out the kind of voices and kind kind of sounds that we created through our throats which otherwise we would have never done in our lives and i used to try the voice the different voices at home also another point about khaga charcha is to treat the instrument in non instrument way making uh, swapna and swikar both understand that they are not playing violin here or they are not playing sitar here they have to contribute to the conversation of the birds through a very unconventional uh, playing methods sandeep was explaining to swikar that like a bird he had to allow some air underneath in his playing what govind and charnu were able to do and swapna with her violin it wasn't to imitate them but it was a way of finding communicating that communicating what that was like and that really helped them to break that uh, inhibition if uh, at all there was any and uh, create wonderful sound patterns your faces began to change as you started to work with it did that um experience make you use your voice or your instruments or your thinking slightly differently in the years since then to me i have been uh, studying voice and voice training methods for last 5 years as part of my phd so uh, this was an interesting perspective for me to to understand what my voice can do i borrow from the piece uh, some of the sound patterns in my warm up today and that has really helped my voice to stabilize quickly like to move on to the other pieces and the other people who were also there next to debora there was um, rahul ravat uh, the architect and priya joshi the dancer i'll start with with priya priya i also had gone to observe some of her classes where she was teaching dance you know she would speak the rhythm often during the dance class she would indicate how they would move guru pushat paghal neeratil tai nagarika magave priya mentioned that when when she choreographs a piece dance comes last into her mind first comes the text then she thinks of the uh, meaning of the text and then she thinks of the body movements and gestures and then perhaps she ends up Uh, choreographing it no nobody no kavi kamagave no kavi kamagave no kavi kamagave no kavi kamagave tulle padiyil vandu it's 
Sandeep, you had done a cut of that of that poem, to, which changed which changed the rhythm and the repetitions of it, extracting the sounds and reassembling them in a very different way, out of the context of the original presentation of of poem. In the piece that she did, where she had spoken, it was reminded me of Western spoken word. We uh, kind of exploited the tonality of the words that she was saying, gave it a bass note, and then tried to figure out what kind of tonal range she is using in her recitation of the bowls, recitation of the words of the composition. And then we kind of uh, gradually crystallize the, the, the tonal points that we were looking for. And then we came up finally with a, with a melodic design. A rough patterns were created. And then the words uh, were, were kind of sung in a way in that pattern. And afterwards it becomes so, so you know, constructive and uh, beautiful piece that we never imagined that we could bring something beautiful from uh, such a small thing, such a small idea. We followed the uh, creative process that the, as a choreographer uh, Priya uses and uh, kind of choreographed the, the tonal space that was available to us with the tones and musical notes that we know and arrange the choreography of sounds. The words for the Bharatnatyam uh, prose, those were also not new, but were, were not very familiar to me. I could actually decode the uh, process of uh, a choreographer's thinking patterns. Her son yeah. had a, a very interesting uh, response. He said, you're turning it into rap. He goes, it's more hip now. She said, I had never imagined that my Bharatanatyam repertoire could be converted into such an interesting and beautiful musical expression. Maybe we can go to the other contributor, the piece with the, the house with seven rooms, I think we called it. Basically went through a building of, of Rahul Ravat and, and invented or found the music of each room very different depending on who lived in the room, what was done in the room. He used certain devices uh, from his uh, architectural training to indicate to the users of that building that this is the dining area, this is the kitchen area, this is the uh, staircase that you are approaching. And all that uh, using the tactile uh, perception of the, of the blind people. And therefore, we came up with this idea of creating a house where different musical ideas would float to indicate what kind of space we are talking about. It was a wonderful idea and uh, how a building is constructed. The same way we were constructing the piece, all the rooms which we, have, we were uh, imagining Every activity had a different tempo, a different lie of the activities. So that was a kind of mixture of the tempos. To me, this, this was an unconventional way, but the vocabulary that we used was conventional music. When, when we make music in the conventional, uh, traditional North Indian Khayal tradition, uh, the raga structure is, is the, at the center. The ideas flowed into each other, they weren't tightly separated, right? When you talk of a space called home, it is never going to be watertight. And uh, there is a lot of give and take that keeps on happening between the people and the uh, kind of energies that are created are always mixed together. And therefore, it was also very important as part of your design 
that the things need to flow all the time. Now, let's talk about one last piece before we then talk maybe about all the musicians. So, uh, Leia Bahavatal. So it was yeah. all about Leia and um, how to change speeds quickly. Now, here we had two, uh, three different uh, compositions, three different bandishes uh, in the same rag. Um, one in a very slow tempo, one in a medium tempo, and one in uh, the fast or drut tempo. And that switch needed to happen very quickly and very seamlessly. There was a lot of back and forth. This bird eye view movement keeps on happening back and forth. And accordingly, we arrange our musical material and the kind of phraseology that we use. You know, what the experience would be. It's like a dizzy, dizzying ride for everybody, for the listener, but also for the players. Sometimes you listen to music or sound and it washes over you. But this doesn't just wash over you. It touches in here. The very beautiful soaring voices of both of you. So maybe let's talk about the other musicians that were part. Svikar, Swapna, yeah. Charu, and Govind. Swapna was the new one in our group. Yes. And a very formidable and, and very present as a new person. How did it happen that you joined the group? All the members of the ensemble are... Uh, partners in crime for many years now. <laughs> so Swapna was always our uh, very close friend and a brilliant violinist. Swapna, I had one of the best tours of Pune. <laughs> it was an hour and a half by, by Otto Rickshaw. And it was uh, remarkable. We went to places that had meaning to her. I saw where she was born. And I saw where she went to school. I saw where the, the market, and with all of them were songs that were attached. She had been with us for over 20, 30 years now. So she became a, an integral part very quickly. And food was always with, with Swapna, food. I, I found it, I found it fantastic that she in, in the house of seven rooms, was in charge of the kitchen. Svika. Svika was already in the ensemble right. since 2015. Uh, Svika happens to be a son of uh, Professor Sunil Katti. Uh, he, he was head of the department music in SNDT University when I worked there in 98 to 2001. And uh, I knew Svikar uh, and I knew he, he was a formidable sitar player in India today. So uh, I talked to him and explained to him this idea. Whatever you know of uh, sitar playing, you may be challenged to the limit. So be ready. <laughs> and he, 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 was a, uh, he was a person who openly said, yes, yes, I would love to have this experience. And then we had the two percussionists. 
to Charu and Govind. And um, I remember one wonderful evening in the first, uh, during our first workshop phase in Aparna's home, where we sat together and exchanged stories, percussionist stories, which, you know, yeah. uh, in every musical culture you have um, uh, uh, particular stories for particular instrument players. And I never had heard Indian percussionist stories. So I was very happy to hear the jokes that they made in percussion. It was the perfect team, I would say. Both of them belong to the same tradition, actually. Mm -hmm. They both have the same guru, Pandit Suresh Tarvalkarji. So uh, they knew their language very well. They knew their instrument very well. And they knew the vocabulary also. They, they talk the same language. And therefore, the exchange was always very intense. That if, if Charu suggests a phrase, then Govind would uh, say, no, 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 let us use the other one. And the other one, without even mentioning the phrase, Charu would start playing that phrase. I felt they were challenging each other also. They were Absolutely. always pushing each other. <laughs> I can do it better. No, I can do it better. <laughs> I remember in one of your talks, Sandeep, you had mentioned that such kind of collaborative trans-traditional projects are feasible only with masters. And that, that was so true with Charu and Govind, that they both were masters, I mean, both are masters. And uh, Charu has always been uh, a pillar of strength for me uh, when it comes to music making, because then uh, he, he would understand what is the requirement even without saying uh, in those many words to him. This non-verbal silent communication is also a key to success of such uh, adventures. One of the last rehearsals, I was sitting and I was doing something and Govind was, was you know, war had tuned his drum and then he was warming up and I was listening. And then all of a sudden I realized... You know, when something catches your ear and you're going, am I, am I hearing what I think I'm hearing? And I look up and he's smiling. And what he was doing was all these little creatures that through the time that I had been there, the frog, the crab, the lizard, the like all of these things, he was playing them. I cannot recall a time when he was not in motion. <laughs> I don't even know if that's possible. And then I hear the crab sound that he's, the, he's got the rhythm of it going across the rock and all of these. And it made me laugh with him. It was like this joke that we had together. And then he, and then at the end of it, he whistled. <laughs> that's good, he's good. Yeah. Uh oh, yeah, he does so not even have work. <laughs> the whole project is dedicated to Govind, who died last year yes. of uh, COVID complications. And I cannot actually imagine how it would be to, to work again without him. And it, I noticed when, when I'm thinking about when thinking about this, how crucial he was to the entire fabric. In last 25 years, whenever I sang, um, he was always there on the stage with me. He, he was extremely close friend of mine, and it it, it has uh, been a very very difficult time for me to accept the fact that uh, he, he is not there now. I was uh, actually responsible uh, for his shifting from a uh, from an ordinary hospital to a big hospital for further care. It was a scary situation in Pune. He was stable. I mean, he talked to me in the evening and next morning he was not there. <laughs>
work is made as a response to three basic cycles of human life. One is the day and night cycle. Second one is the cycle of seasons. And the third one is the birth and death cycle, which we believe in. In 2015, when uh, you, you first uh, wrote to me about the Dhwani Sutra project, uh, I was rather wondering what kind of ideas you have in mind and what we as Indian musicians would be able to contribute. Actually, I don't have an expectation ever when I come. I, I Well, I have an expectation that I meet, you know, with you and that we start working together. And I think what um, makes our encounter so special for me is that I come with nothing in my head. There's so much suddenly that happens in our conversations and just meeting and, you know, being in this space with you. Thank you for that. And let's continue. Yeah. We would love to be together again. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 